relationship between the U.S. government and the Islamic right in the Middle East. This event was hosted by the Politics and Prose Bookstore in Washington, D.C. And tonight, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce Robert Dreyfus, who has a new book called The Devil's Game. Uh, and he's going to talk about that, about of how that we have supported fundamentalist Islam over the last 50 years. He was approached by uh, a group called the American Empire Project, who is soliciting kind of books uh, that uh, explain more the history and the dynamics of why that they feel that our American foreign policy is headed uh, in the last uh, number of years toward imperial democracy, of uh, going into other countries where we've had such a valuable democratic heritage of our own. They feel that it's now been transformed into uh, taking that uh, our democratic values into the Middle East a lot in places where the, we have not been asked to come. And so th this book is in that uh, uh, that field. Uh, when Robert Dreyfus set in to write this book, he then uh, did just an amazing amount of archival research in inter interviews. It's really, I was so impressed with the, num with the amount of work that he had done on this, and Publishers Weekly was too. They gave it a starred review in Publishers Weekly, and they saved that for what they think are the most important books that are coming out in a field. Uh, we're starting 50 years ago during the Eisenhower administration uh, where we were in the midst of the Cold War. We had policy makers uh, who were in the CIA, the State Department, the Pentagon, who felt that our number one priority was fighting Marxism. Uh, and the Cold War, and that whoever that they could find as their allies, that they would willingly sign up. And so that since we had on this southern frontier of the Soviet Union, we had so much Islamic fundamentalism that was the, the Russians and the uh, Islamicists were uh, at war with each other, I, our State Department figured, I think, of who's a better friend than the enemy of an enemy. And uh, so they selected the Islamic right and started in on a period that went through soliciting the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt on into soliciting the Taliban during the early 90s. Uh, a whole range of Islamic fundamentalist groups that we found, financed, trained, uh, and now it's all coming back to haunt us. This monster has now been Satanized by our current administration, but what we forget the whole time is that we created that monster, very much so by our own foreign policy. So here's Robert Dreyfus to talk about it. It's a wonderful story to hear. Thanks very much. I, yeah, I'm not sure how wonderful a story is. It, it's it's no, a sad it's a sad story to hear, but um, maybe once in a while we'll learn from history. Um, it's it's a pleasure to be here at Politics and Prose. I've been here so many times on the other side of the microphone, and and now I get to stand here and and talk to all of you. So it's it's actually quite an honor and and a thrill. Be and I, and I thank you for inviting me, of course. And and um, I um. Uh, some of you maybe n know me from my magazine articles and other things. I'm primarily a journalist. I write for uh, a number of magazines from Rolling Stone to Mother Jones and The Nation and other conservative outlets. And so I, <laughs> I, I've, I have, and that's how the, the people behind the American Empire Project found me through my magazine articles and, and suggested that I write this book. Um, I'm terrible for giving advice to other authors because I don't have an agent um, I didn't really shop this book around. They called me and I sent them a proposal and they liked it and, and now it's a book. So um, the mysteries of how you get published are still a mystery to me and maybe someday I'll, I'll unlock that. Um, and I also have a website, by the way, for anybody who 
uh, I'm going to skip my own bi biography, so you can, if you're really interested in who I am, you can find it on my website, which is, is my name, robertdreyfus.com. Um, this book is primarily a history. Um, it, it's a historical look uh, at Middle East policy over the last 50 or 60 years. Uh, I'm not an historian, um, so um, I probably made mistakes that I shouldn't have made for that reason. I approached it as a journalist. Um, I read a lot of books, and I stand on all those shoulders. But I also, uh, as Barbara said, did a lot of interviews uh, and research, approaching it again as a journalist, talking to people who'd served overseas um, in the State Department or the CIA or with the military, uh, as well as policymakers here in Washington who had the the good fortune or the bad fortune to have to uh, deal in this very complex and complicated part of the world. Um, and in doing that work as a journalist, um, I, I did it not because I wanted to tell a history, but because I hope that we don't make the same mistakes again. Um, but I guess I wanted to start out tonight by talking for about a minute about Iraq, because one of the utter paradoxes of our Iraq policy for the past uh, three years now is that we went into Iraq, whether you supported or opposed it, as I did, um, we toppled a government, we created chaos, I would think everyone would pretty much agree with that. And we now find ourselves, though, on one hand battling insurgents who don't want us there, and on the other hand, our troops are supporting a radical right Islamist government made up of Shiite fundamentalists who have multiple ties to Iran and to its Islamist government, who um, have a long history, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that tonight, uh, have a long history of being Islamist organizers in Iraq opposed to not only Saddam's government but to several previous governments. So here we find ourselves having gone into Iraq to create a democracy and end up installing a Shiite theocracy that has death squads and torture prisons and operates illegal paramilitary groups all across the country that are imposing um, benighted views of social and family and marriage laws and attitudes toward women uh, bombing liquor stores and barber shops because they don't want people to shave and movie theaters and otherwise um, trying to drag this once modern country back to the seventh century. These are the people that we put in power and, and this is the Islamists that we're now essentially not only allied to but protecting as a Praetorian Guard. Um, our ambassador there, as you know, is Zalmay Khalilzad who has a long history in American politics and diplomacy. But I wanted to start out, I guess, because in my research I found an interesting quote from him, and I'm going to try to do a little bit of reading from the book, but really just of the other voices that are in this book, because it's better than just me um, talking about it. Um, this is from December of 1979. Um, just about the time of the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, which I, I believe was about um, the day after Christmas or something like that. Um, at a time, by the way, when a month before or so, the uh, Iranian government had taken our embassy hostage and Islam was certainly on people's minds. Um, so I just wanted to read a couple of sentences here from, from Mr. Khalilzad. Um After the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan in December 1979, Zalmay Khalilzad, a neoconservative analyst, RAND strategist, and future U.S. ambassador to Afghanistan, and of course now Iraq, wrote a paper in which he suggested that the problems that Khomeini's regime had created for the USSR. Quote, the Khomeini regime also poses risks to the Soviets, he wrote. The change of regime has encouraged similar movements in Iraq and Afghanistan and might even affect Soviet Muslim Central Asia. That's all a quote from him. He said, added, quote, the cost for the Soviet Union could include possible domestic unrest in those regions of the USSR referred to by the Soviets as their, quote, internal colony. The Islamic population of Soviet Central Asia, 
which could reach 100 million by the year 2000, where despite official attempts at assimil assimilation, Islamic consciousness forms a kind of counterculture and may be susceptible to Muslim agitation if the Soviets continue to make war on their ethnic and religious counterparts across the border. Hostility to the Soviets may generally increase in Muslim countries and groups. So in other words, while our men and women were being held hostage in Iran, here you have Ambassador Khalilzad, not then an ambassador, suggesting that Islam and Islamic activism was primarily a threat to the Soviet Union and not to the United States. That, that encapsulates the theme of, of my book, and I, I encountered that idea again and again and again, going back really to the 19th century. I think chapter one talks about the British and their role, but especially after World War II when the United States kind of stumbled into the Middle East as the big power that had responsibility for this part of the world now, but really not much knowledge about it. And to understand the story that I'm going to talk about tonight, you have to step back into a time when there was no global war on terrorism, when Islam was not the fearful bugaboo that it is today, and step back into the Cold War, which had its own kind of anything goes environment. In other words, now with the, the war on terrorism, you know, the Bush administration argues anything goes, whether it's the Patriot Act or creating a big Homeland Security Department or authorizing torture of captives or using the National Security Agency to spy on uh, U.S. persons uh, illegally. All of those things are okay because we're fighting this war on terrorism. Well, during the Cold War, the same logic prevailed, but with a different enemy, of course. And one of the things under the Anything Goes topic was the role of political Islam and the idea that Islam could be a barrier or a bulwark or a force that would oppose, first of all, the Soviet Union and communism, but later we find also to oppose the nationalists that were beginning to emerge in this post-colonial time. Um, and I started looking at some of the academic debates and the early think tanks and university debates and so forth at that time, at the early, sort of the dawn of the Cold War. One of the most interesting ones I found was by a man who has now emerged as one of the chief architects and advisor to Dick Cheney on the war on terrorism and a, a, a very well-known uh, partisan of the clash of civilizations. In fact, he invented the term, and I'm talking about Bernard Lewis. Um, he's a professor at Princeton now who's written about 2,800 books about, uh, about Islam they're actually, it's the same book written over and over and over again. Um, so I found an essay of his from 1953, which, this is the same, this is not his father, by the way, this is the same Professor Lewis, um, who uh, 53 years ago uh, wrote an essay called Communism and Islam, and I wanted to quote a, a couple of sentences from that. If, and by the way, you have to think of this, what I'm about to read, to you now in the context of the president's idea that we have to create democracy in the Middle East rather than authoritarian or uh, dictatorship type regimes, right? This is from Bernard Lewis. Quote, if the peoples of Islam are forced to make a, a straight choice to abandon their own traditions in favor of either communism or parliamentarianism, then we are at a great disadvantage. It is fortunate both for Islam and for the Western world, that the choice is not restricted to those two simple alternatives. For the possibility still remains for the Muslim peoples of restoring, perhaps in modified form, their own tradition of evolving a form of government which, though authoritarian and perhaps even autocratic, is nevertheless far removed from the cynical tyranny of European-style dictatorship. Communism is not and cannot be a religion, while Islam, for the great mass of believers, still is. And that is the core of the Islamic resistance to communist ideas. And, and he goes on and talks about Islam and a religion and how it could be a barrier. He says, pious Muslims, and most Muslims are pious, will not long tolerate an atheist creed, 
nor one that violates their traditional religious moral principles. Now, this was not the dominant or only view at the time. There was a great debate within the State Department and the intelligence community and elsewhere about to what extent Islam would be a barrier to communism or might even be receptive to communism. There were people who came down on all sides and there were also people who thought that Islam was a receding force, that it was something that belonged to the, the Middle Ages or the past and that as the area modernized that, that Islam would fade. But there are a number of other people, um, and I quote several of them in my, my book, who, who put this idea forward. And I wanted to quote one other because it's um, such a, I don't know, I, I took it as a, a fascinating one, a man named uh, Bayard Dodge from the Dodge family, um, one of the uh, descendants of the early U.S. missionary families who founded the American University in Beirut and who were the founders really of uh, American Orientalism in, in many ways. Um, uh, Dodge said uh, in an essay that he wrote about the same time, um, to a large extent national, uh, uh, to a large extent nationalism has taken the place of the religious side of the pan-Islam movement. Needless to say, it is the young Muslim uninterested in Islam as a great system who is particularly likely to become a communist. If Islam is undermined, if materialism and radicalism come in, with communist thought perhaps permeating it, the outcome will certainly be a major tragedy for the world. Now, these were theoreticians, these were academics, these were social scientists, and, and also kind of the, the waspish elite that, that uh, formed the, the really the core of our policymaking elite, especially in the 1950s. Now, now that's, I suppose, somewhat less true. But this had immediate real implications for American policy, and there's so many stories and examples from the Cold War, but I, I wanted to cite one to you, which I thought was the, the funniest one. Um, they, it, it was a program called the, the Red Pig Program. Uh, it was started by the U.S. Information Agency, which then, uh, or a service, which was then really a branch of the intelligence community. It worked very closely with the, the CIA. Um, they created a poster, this was in uh, Iraq, of all places, um, trying to reach out to Iraqi Muslims, the same ones that were now, I suppose, either battling or protecting, depending on what side of the civil war they're on. Um, here's the quote from the actual uh, declassified um, State Department memo about this. The poster, quote, tells the story of the greedy red pig and how he came to a bad end. The fact that the pig is wearing a red star on his armband and has it at his rear, instead of the normally piggy curl, a hammer and sickle tail, has not escaped the observers. Others remarked on the suitability of making the communist villain a pig because of the resistance appeal it has for Muslims. We feel that a whole series of cartoon posters can be developed using the red pig as a central figure. Now, that may seem ludicrous today, but in fact, here you have a, a serious proposal. And there, there was another one to take an Iraqi cleric. Um, Miles Copeland wrote about this in one of his books, a uh, former CIA guy who was a Middle East veteran, to create a Muslim Billy Graham and to send him, you know, around preaching, sort of bought and paid for by the, by the CIA. These things maybe we see echoed in the recent story in the New York Times just a couple of days ago about the Lincoln Group that was hired as a consultant to the Pentagon and went into Iraq over the last two years and started bribing and paying for uh, various um, Sunni clerics, uh, probably part of the Iraqi branch of the Muslim Brotherhood, and, and trying to recruit them into supporting the American um, presence in Iraq. So you had these various covert and also some overt activities going on uh, with the intelligence community and the State Department throughout the region during the 1950s and 60s. And one of the most uh, egregious, I would say, uh, and I tell the story in some detail in my book, uh, is the story of Saeed Ramadan. Um, he was the um, international organizer for the Muslim Brotherhood, which was an organization founded in the 1920s in Egypt and became quite powerful during 
the 30s and 40s, and by the early 50s, it emerged as a very strong force in Egypt. Said Ramadan married the daughter of the Muslim Brotherhood's founder, so he had a kind of a claim to royalty. And there's a photograph of him in 1953 in the Oval Office in Washington meeting with uh, President Eisenhower. And I describe all of this in my book, and I discuss the ambassador in Egypt, Jefferson Caffrey, and his uh, memo to, presumably to the CIA or the State Department, you know, identifying Ramadan as somebody we could work with. Here he is in the Oval Office with Eisenhower at a time when it was known to everyone who knew anything about the Middle East that this organization was a, a basically a terrorist organization. It was the first Islamist terrorist group. They had assassinated dozens of people, including an Egyptian prime minister. They had a strong paramilitary underground. Uh, they had an, a thing called the secret apparatus, which was kind of an intelligence arm. And Saeed Ramadan, from the 1950s until he died in 1995, turns up again and again and again in every aspect of uh, the growth of the Islamist movement, from the founding of the Muslim Brotherhood itself to the founding of the Liberation Party or Hizb Tahrir, which is now important in Central Asia, to the Islamicization of, of Pakistan and the growth of the Jamaat-e Islami there. He, he helped to build and was on the the board of directors of the Muslim World League when it was founded in 1962 in Saudi Arabia. He was involved in the Iranian Revolution. He was involved in the Islamicization of Egypt, in the Jihad in Afghanistan, which was, of course was a multi-billion dollar CIA project. And he did all of this uh, from his headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland, where he founded something called the Islamic Center. Um, he was also, we now know, recruited in the 1950s by the CIA. The Wall Street Journal ran an article about this over the summer, uh, having dug into the German archives and, and found out that Ramadan was in fact recruited by the CIA and worked uh, with Radio Liberty and some of the early um, Amcon Lib and other sort of groups that were aimed at surrounding and, and um, reaching into the Soviet Union and trying to find minorities that would be uh, you know, capable of riled up. So, Saeed Ramadan is one example kind of that grows out of this Red Pig program, and there are many, many others that I, I talk about in the book, of how we took these theories that people like Bernard Lewis and others talked about and put them into, into practice. Um, I found, uh, I, I interviewed a guy named David Long, who is a um, longtime State Department intelligence guy very wry sense of humor. He, he's still around out in Northern Virginia. And I went out to his house and spent a long time with him and talked about this. And we were discussing how at the beginning in the 40s and 50s and even into the 60s, the United States had almost no familiarity either with the Middle East or with Islam. There were no Middle East studies centers at all in the United States until the first one in 1947 in, in Princeton. And it took really a generation to train even the semi-competent people who then later in the 70s and 80s began to go into the, the, the government professions. At this time we really had, and, and, and David was talking about that with me, he said, we didn't know anything, this is his quote. When you get up to the period around World War II, yeah, there were times when Islam was used as a rallying cry. We were trying a replay of what they tried a thousand years ago. Their ideology is ancient. Well. We never heard any of this when we jumped into this 1,300-year-old saga simply because we were the biggest player in the game. So it was usually said, this is still long talking, that the oil company kids and the missionary kids knew a little, but I've talked to them, many of them, over the years. They lived in their own little world, and what they knew, in fact, was very, very limited. We wanted oil, we wanted to fight communism, but we weren't really interested in all that crap about Islam. We were neophytes way behind the curve of what the British and the French picked up after all the time we'd spent there. And he was one of a number of people that I talked in the book who consistently came up with the idea that maybe we ought to think about this. Maybe if you start to play with religion, it becomes like Mickey Mouse and the Sorcerer's Apprentice. In other words, maybe if you start to play with religion, it gets out of control because these are very powerful forces that you set into motion 
and they go off and they start doing things on their own, um, as you know, Osama bin Laden could explain to us today. So um, there was another guy, a, a CIA guy I talked to who was involved in a lot of this, and I asked him about this, and he didn't want me to use his name, but here's his, his comments about this, this process. He said, what other poll was there? King Hussein? The optic was the Cold War. The Cold War was the defining clarity of the time. We saw Nasser as socialist, anti-Western, anti-Baghdad pact, and we were looking for some kind of counterfoil. Saudi efforts to Islamicize the region were seen as powerful and effective and likely to be successful. We loved that. We had an ally against communism. So we had a choice after 1956 when Eisenhower intervened, if you, if you remember, to roll back the British, French, Israeli attack on Egypt. We, we could have supported Nasser, I suppose, and supported the idea of Arab nationalism. And there were many people who advocated that, including the, the much derided Arabists. But others, um, the realpolitik people and the people who believed in, in, um, in American kind of semi-imperial presence above all, chose the other side of the equation, namely to support King Saud and the Saudis and their foreign policy arm, which was the Islamic movement. Now, the Saudis never let the Muslim Brotherhood establish itself inside Saudi Arabia because it was a volatile organization that they themselves realized couldn't be controlled. But they funded it massively and they supported it everywhere from Turkey and Pakistan and Egypt and North Africa because that was their foreign policy arm. That was their way of using um, what they could as the guardians of Mecca and Medina and the holy places and so forth. Now, this is kind of a joke because most of the Saudi princes, as you know, are libertines and they drink and they smoke and they whore and they go to the south of France and they have yachts. They're not really very good Muslims for the most part but they knew how to use religion as a tool and, and we bought into that and we supported that um, as this uh, CIA guy said. And, and so there are several turning points in this book, in this history, one being the 1950s when we might have opted to give more support to uh, Arab nationalism, although it's kind of an analog with Vietnam by the way because I, I suppose in the 1940s we could have uh, and I think there were some people who advocated this, supported Ho Chi Minh and the liberation of Vietnam from France, but instead, um, for realpolitik reasons, we chose to support French colonialism and the return of France to Vietnam. And, well, we know where that led. Um, another turning point was 1967, because the defeat of the Arabs in that war and the destruction of Nasser, he died three years later, um, really went a long way to destroying the concept of uh, so-called Arab nationalism. And that's when the Islamists made their next big leap forward by taking advantage of the, the uh, belief that Arab nationalism was dead and that the, the population of the region had nowhere else to go, had no other defining ideology. So the Islamists put themselves forward as um, we're the people that you can, you can listen to. And then, of course, the third turning, turning point, which I talk about in my book, is the Iranian Revolution in 1979, which took all of this fairly vague notion of Islamism and crystallized it into now a state uh, based around political Islam. Now, you might argue that General Zia did that in Pakistan a couple of years before, in 1977, and even that Pakistan itself was built around the concept of political Islam, but, but I think Iran took it a lot further. And the same thing with Saudi Arabia. Um, this is a state that was created by the British in the 1920s when the, the British backed the Saud family and its tribal alliances and the Wahhabis to, to establish preeminence in the, the Arabian Peninsula. Saudi Arabia, too, was an Islamic state, but Iran really took that one step further, too. Um, uh, on the Iraq issue, 
um, I have a section in my book. I, I wish I had more time to, uh, in, in space in the book to have, have written more about this. But a lot of the groups that we're now uh, dealing with in running Iraq uh, including the Supreme Council for the Islamic Revolution of Iraq, Siri, which is one of the, I guess, the dominant force in Iraq today, and, and Muqtada Sadr's group, the Mahdi Army, which is the other most powerful sort of militia and political force. And, and they, along with al-Dawa, the Dawa party, are the, the three groups that make up this ruling Shiite coalition now in Iraq. Well, in the book I talk on... Uh, page 176, 77, about the background to this, because these groups grew out of the 1950s at a time when the vast majority of Iraqi Shiites were communists, when the Iraqi Communist Party could bring a million people into the streets of Baghdad and march up and down demanding this or that. The Ayatollahs of Iraq mobilized Iraqi Shias through their schools, through the mosques, and so forth, as a massive counterforce to this effort to try to bring the Shia back into their control. I couldn't prove in my book that this was somehow encouraged by the British or the Americans, although I, I believe that it, it probably had the hand of the British in it because they had such a long history in Iraq, including uh, since the 19th century, funding most of the main um, Ayatollah families from Iraq. And the Hakim family uh, and the Sadr family, uh, who are now the powers, well, their uncles and, and fathers and grandfathers in the 1950s built these parties, uh, including al-Dawa, which, by the way, got support from the Shah of Iran uh, in his battles with Iraq. The Savak intelligence agency supported al-Dawa, for instance. Um, so this was, this were not, these are not movements that suddenly emerged after the fall of Saddam. But this Islamist current was a long-time right-wing force, pretty much analogous to the Christian right in the United States, um, that, that organized itself as a battering ram against the secular and less religious and, and even more nationalist and even leftist parts of the Iraqi Shiite community. So th there's a long history to that. And, I talk in my book um, about mistakes that were made by other parties as well, not just the colonial powers, but I have a chapter about Israel and how after 1967, when the Israelis occupied the West Bank and Gaza, they had the bright idea to unleash political Islam as a way of combating the, the growth of Palestinian nationalism and the PLO. And Ahmed Yassin, who was the founder of Hamas in 1987, was in prison in Gaza in 1967. And, when, and, and of course, at that time, Gaza came under Egyptian control until the war. And the Egyptians were at war with the Muslim Brotherhood. And uh, uh, Yassin was a leader of the Palestinian branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. And when the Israelis occupied Gaza, they released Yassin from prison. And not only did they release him, but over the next 20 years, the Israelis spent a great deal of effort to foster the spread of Islam, to build mosques, to allow money to come in. They worked with Yassin to legalize his Islamic association, he called it. Um, all of this early efforts, I mean, this the, the fact is that had it not been for that early 20-year period, Hamas would have never come into existence. And now we see it's grown to a force that it'll probably cause the PLO to uh, postpone the elections in, in uh, Palestine scheduled for later this month because Hamas is such a strong or, or powerful force. And, and, I, and I talked to a number of people, including a, a woman named Martha Kessler, who was a very smart CIA analyst at the time, and I'll, I'll read you one quote from her, and then I'll, I'll try to wrap up so we can take questions. Um, this is from Martha Kessler. She, she, as I said, she was a CIA analyst. We saw Israel cultivate Islam as a counterweight to Palestinian nationalism. Radical Islam and extremism didn't come into play as much with the Palestinians as elsewhere, at least early on. 
But their move toward Islamic radicalism didn't take place until the Israelis encouraged it, and quite a bit. Although they weren't responsible for it completely, they didn't crack down on it. They allowed them to flourish. Where they could fiddle around with events to elevate Islamists to the detriment of Fatah, they would. They treat religious figures with deference. And then David Long, who I referred to you earlier, said, I thought they were playing with fire. I didn't realize they'd end up creating a monster, but I don't think you ought to mess around with potential fanatics. Well, of course, we did men mess around with potential fanatics a number of times, uh, most notably in Afghanistan. And I have several chapters in my book about that and about the jihad in Afghanistan and about Bill Casey's role in fostering not only that jihad inside the country, but trying to extend that across the border, across the river, into the Soviet Union itself. And this is a policy that began, believe it or not, in the 1960s. There's a long record of American involvement with Afghan Islamists and Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood activists. Um, I, I found out in Arlington a, a, a couple, um, the Bannigans, who worked for the CIA through a thing called the Asia Foundation. And at the, in, until 1969, the Asia Foundation was a wholly owned subsidiary of the CIA. And they served time in Pakistan and Afghanistan during the 50s and 60s, and they talked about it quite openly with me, um, helping to build contacts with these Islamist parties, literally the same ones that 20 years later would be in the 1980s fighting the jihad. Um, so, in other words, again, with Afghanistan, it didn't just happen all of a sudden in, in 1980 um, or 79, but there was a history to this of our engagement with Afghan Islamists, um, which, which um, you know, takes us back to um, this whole debate about whether Islam and, and communism or nationalism were, were antithetical. Um, so, I, I mean, I could talk for three or four more hours, but I'm just going to end with one quote here, uh, and then we'll have questions. This is my own little, I, mean, I guess this is the preachy part of my talk, because I, I try to say a little bit about what we can do to fix this problem. Um, not that uh, Vice President is going to listen to me, but um, he, here's my paragraph on that. Uh, just so you know, people are going to ask me, I think, what I think about this. The true emancipation of the Middle East will require action by the secular forces in the region to uplift, educate, and modernize the outlook of people who've been captured by Islamism. It is an effort that will take decades, but it must begin now. There is nothing about Islam that requires it to remain mired in the seventh century belief that the Quran must govern the world of politics, education, science, and culture. It means changing a culture that allows millions of deluded Muslims to think that back to basics fundamentalism is somehow an appropriate answer to 21st century problems and concerns. Fundamentalism, whether it takes the form of Islamism or whether it appears in the form of America's Christian right or Israel's ultra-Orthodox settler movement, is always a reactionary force. In the Muslim world, a rational division of the secular and the divine is far from unheard of. Tens of millions of Muslims are able to separate their religious beliefs held privately from their politics, just as millions of Muslims, Christians, and do Jews do in the United States. It is they, the true silent majority, who must seize the initiative from the fundamentalists. Um, how we get from here to there, well, that's another question. Um, I think it starts with, with lowering the political temperature and trying to seize the ground out from underneath the radicals and the people who are capitalizing on anger and bitterness and resentment that's been built up over several generations. And it may take several generations to, to fix. So I'm going to take a drink of water. Um, but I hope there are people that are going to ask me questions both about the book and also about um, current events or anything else that's on your mind. So um, go ahead. Yeah, I, I see in your attempt to equate what you call the Islamic right and the Christian right, um, you describe Bill Casey as a devout <laughs> Catholic uh, dovetailing with uh, the rock-ribbed faith of President Reagan. And since 9-11, you seem to cast doubt on Attorney General Ashcroft's claim that thousands of al-Qaeda 
uh, operatives uh, have inf infiltrated the U.S. Uh, I take it you don't believe the Patriot Act and other actions of the Bush administration had anything to do with stopping uh, what, what I, I mean, how many operatives do you believe or estimate may have infiltrated the U.S.? Uh, I would say close to zero. Um, Ashcroft said after 9-11 that there were 5,000 Al-Qaeda operatives in the United States. In the four years since 9-11, not one American has even been punched in the nose by a mad Islamist. So, if there were 5,000 or 500 or even 50, presumably one or two of them could have gotten a gun on any gun show in Texas and gone to the Mall of America and killed 20 or 30 people and shut down every mall in America. So I don't take the Al-Qaeda threat as seriously as Bush does. Now, yes, can they kill some people? Can they blow up a subway car in London? Can they do some things like that? Of course they can. It's a dangerous bunch of guys. And we need to spy on them and track them down, and, and we need to do what we can to get rid of them. But I think the idea that radical political Islam is somehow equivalent to uh, Nazism or communism as a worldwide foe is is worse than absurd. It's, it, it's, a, it's a stupid um, understand, misunderstanding of the seriousness of, of the threat that we face. And as far as the religious views of, of Casey and Reagan, it, it isn't just them. It was all of our presidents, from Eisenhower to Carter to Clinton, who continually made the mistake of looking at these Muslim fundamentalists and saying, well, I'm a religious man. I believe in the Bible. Therefore, these guys can't be so bad, so we ought to be able to work with them. We ought to, the Taliban, the, I mean, here, I'll read you a quote from Jimmy Carter because I, oh, I don't know, because I love this quote. Um, in, in the middle of um, the hostage crisis, um, Jimmy Carter, who, as we know, was a Christian, uh, I don't know, born-again person, um, Hamilton Jordan describes this. He, he walks up to Carter, who's sitting at his desk in the Oval Office, um, quote, see me later if you don't mind. I'm writing a letter to Khomeini. Jordan says, I was amused at the idea of the Southern Baptist writing to the Muslim fanatic. What will he say to the man, I thought? Maybe he'll sign the letter, quote, the great S Satan. Now, back to the quote from Jimmy Carter. Quote, if Khomeini is the religious leader he purports to be, Carter said, I don't see how he can condone the holding of our people. I mean, excuse me, these are not the kind of people that Jimmy Carter went to Sunday school with. The, the man, Saeed Ramadan, that Eisenhower met in the Oval Office was not the kind of guy that he grew up in Kansas with at, you know, the local uh, fish fries at the church that he went to. Um, this is a completely different culture, which the politicians especially whether it was Eisenhower or Carter or Reagan, completely misunderstood. And to the extent they did understand it, they didn't care. They said, the overriding cause of fighting communism is so important that even if these are bad guys, you know, we're going to work with them. And, and that lots of these guys are on the record. Brzezinski is on the record saying that. Uh, I interviewed Daniel Pipes, who is probably the single most determined enemy of anything that smells Muslim in the world. And he said, yeah, it was absolutely the right thing to do. The quote is in the book, to support the jihadists in Afghanistan. And in fact, the ones who were the most militant and most brutal were the best anti-communist fighters. And those are the ones we had to support the strongest. So they didn't have any qualms about this. Is that because they really understood it? I don't think so. I think they missed the whole point, And that's why we're paying at least part of the reason why we're paying the price that we're paying today. You so know, the 9-11 attackers did seem, for the most part, to be model citizens until they chose to carry out their plan. Yeah, well, they, they of course, they disguised themselves that way. But if they're, if they're waiting another four years to, you know, all 5,000 of them, I, I guess um, I, I'm wrong, and we'll find out. Yeah, go ahead. Um, Brzezinski, who was uh, Carter's Secretary of State, propounded this doctrine of nationalism being the Achilles heel of the, uh, of the Soviet Union. What he meant by that was a combination of nationalism and religion. He coined the term arc of crisis, by which he was referring to the southern USSR and the borderland region. Right. 
And he played a role, at least as a propagandist. And I wonder if you touched on that role. Moreover, second part of the question. Uh, CIA and other intelligence agencies know something about blowback because throughout their history, they've had incidences of blow, blowback. You can look at Jem uh, uh, in, uh, in South Vietnam, for, as an example. He was, he was supported by the Kennedys in upstate New York and as a nationalist, etc. but eventually we dumped him. Was there any sense among CIA and State Department people at that time that in fact this was a danger in our involvement in Afghanistan in a proxy war? Whether the yeah, guys we were um, training, the guys we were training, like Bin Laden and the others, might come back to right. turn their guns in a different direction. Um, okay, on the issue of Brzezinski, I have, have an extended section in the book about a little crew that began in the 1950s led by a man named Alexander Benningsen, who was a European theoretician of minorities and especially Islam. And he created an entire school of thought that said that, uh, as you said, not just nationalism but Islam could be the downfall of the USSR. And he wrote books with titles like The Islamic Threat to the Soviet Union and so forth. And I, and I have all this in the book. And Benningsen and his crew, and uh, I think a man named Paul Henze, and there were two or three others, worked with Brzezinski at a thing called the Nationalities Working Group in the Carter administration that was a, a little functional unit within the National Security Council that had the specific job of trying to stoke the flames of Islam within that part of the Soviet Union, along what you call the Ark of Crisis. And Brzezinski was, uh, as a descendant of this Polish noble family and as someone who was fiercely anti-communist, completely bought into this notion. Um, by the way, the guy who took over the Nationalities Working Group after Reagan came in, it continued to exist and it was run by um, Richard Pipes, the father of Daniel Pipes, who, who um, is another uh, sort of Brzezinski type and a militant anti-communist. Yes, absolutely, those people believed that Islam would be the downfall of the Soviet Union. Um, and I have a lot of sort of the background to that in the book. Now, in terms of the specific issue of did people understand about the blowback concept, um, I found a huge amount of denial. I talked to several of the CIA guys who ran the Afghan war. They're all around here. You can find them and talk to them pretty easily. And they all said, um, you know, we we don't buy it. We, you know, we fought that war. We had these. We had it contained, and and uh, I, I don't know. They won't admit. Maybe they can't admit to themselves. Um, but I did not find. I mean, except for the people who've spoken out, and there have been books about this topic. Um, I, I haven't found too many people who want to be introspective about it and say, yeah, we, you know, we made a mistake and we're sorry for it. There's, there's not a whole heck of a bunch of apologies happening about that. And of course. The famous quote from Brzezinski about the topic, when he gave the interview about seven years ago to a French magazine called Le Nouvel Observateur, um, he, he basically said, yeah, you know, we deliberately provoked the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan by stirring up Islam forces against uh, the, the pro-communist government there. And he said, his famous quote is, what's a bunch of stirred up Muslims compared to the fall of the Soviet Union? Well. That was three years before 9/11. He might take that back now. I don't know. I don't. I don't know if all the journalists who've interviewed him, if anybody has asked him about that quote that he made seven years ago. I, I tried to call him and he didn't call me back. So, um, uh, but of course now he's emerged as a big opponent of Bush on Iraq. So maybe people don't want to get him too mad. You know. I don't know. I, w I would. I'd, that'd be the first thing I'd ask him. Thank you. Sure. You, you do an excellent job in, in picking this thing apart and making it understandable. Um, one of th the other thing, though, is the other side. In other words, we always assume that people who are making these decisions are doing it with the U.S. interests in mind and so forth. But if you go back, if you start with the Dulleses and even further back, there are there are plots within plots, and I don't want to get paranoid about this, but the fact of the matter is 
these things are, are passed along and you don't get into the CIA, you don't get into the higher echelons in the decision making process. So for you to put this out there is great. Uh, the point I'm trying to make though is unless there's an effort from the American side, I mean the people, to change the way these decisions are being made and who are the groups that are supporting these so-called leaders, we'll never get anywhere. It'll be book after book after book and revelation after revelation after revelation and we'll be in the same spot time and time again. Well, yeah, so is there a question in there or? Yeah, yeah. your response to that. I mean, um, in other words, you're bringing out one side like you said, you don't think Cheney's going to read the book and, and, and grab all the, the messages. But what I'm saying is that expectation could never be there. So I'm, I'm saying if you look at the side of our decision making process, do you even think there's a chance to get a, a foreign policy that... that I, I mean, if I didn't think there was a chance to change things, I wouldn't be a journalist and I wouldn't write this book. I mean, of course there's a chance. I, I think, you know, I spent two years before 2004 writing about the manipulation of intelligence and the, the, everything else that got us into Iraq and I, I couldn't believe when Bush got reelected because it, it, it stunned me that people could go to the polls and vote for this guy who lied us into a war. Um, the, but the collapse came four months later starting in March of this year or of 2005 when Bush's popularity fell off a cliff and people began to realize that the myths that they had been force-fed, namely that Saddam was somehow behind 9-11 and all of that, were, were not true or that, you know, the, I mean, so things have changed in the past year. Now, is that enough? I don't know. I mean, you know, sometimes there's a glacial pace to this and I don't know if a year from now we'll be saying things are worse or better or, you know, the same. I don't know. but. Um, you know, the more books, the better, I guess, is oh, my... Oh, yeah, opinion. yeah. I support you. Thank yep. you. Hi, Mr. Dreyfus. How are you? I I'm great. Thanks. How are you? There's one thing I want to say, and I want the audience to hear. I want to make this clear. A friend of mine told me this. It's a very important point, and I'd like to ask you a question about your subject. There's a man who brought Einstein out of Germany in 1933. He lived in Washington. died here. He was a presidential advisor from Roosevelt to Reagan. Asked him what he did. He was World War One, World War Two, and World War Three. I said, "What do you mean World War Three? He said, "Everything since 1945. Vietnam War began in 1945 to 1975. Ten thousand day war, six to eight million killed. World War Three. There's no Cold War. Forget that term. Drop it, please." Okay. So thank you. What's What's uh, the question? I can give you his name, and you can read about him. Are you familiar with Rifat al-Assad, King Hafez al-Assad's brother? Sure, he's still around. He was in Mirabella, Spain, when Jose Maria Aznar was saying, we must get all the terrorists. terrorists. In the early part of 1982, he killed 40,000 people in the town of Hama, Syria. 40,000 people in a week. We must get all the terrorists. Everyone's saying. He's a weapons dealer for George Herbert Walker Bush, billionaire. And for some reason, he went back last year to Damascus. Bin Laden. Okay, you should ask a question because we're. Bin, I, I mean, well, I have established okay. something you, you don't okay. seem to know yet. Bin Laden and Franny Tunjun. Franny Tunjun under the Croat swastika. Bin Laden under the Hanzar swastika in 1990. That's how the Yugoslav Adriatic Coast War began. Yasinovich was the third largest death camp in Europe, Europe 40 miles south of Zagreb. There's a lot of people waiting. The so. daughter of the judge who put Franny Tujman in jail in the 1970s is in your audience tonight. Well, okay, anybody's I'm welcome. I'm here to witness and, and ask if you a I question. Told Are you was familiar here, with I'd these? Are you, do you know that we've killed four million Iraqis? Two to seven million Afghanis were starved to death 2001 to 2002. You didn't see any. Ninety percent of the population of Afghanistan does not live in the cities. Do you know the Congo? General Kagame came from Sir, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Look, I appreciate your sentiment. But you were watching when, the Bronco chase. When your book comes out, I'll. No, I'll this is part of your book. book. I'm familiar with your book. Oh, okay. Thank you. Please add facts. It's not a travelogue. Please respect the people who died, the victims of war. 
that's the important thing. I didn't hear you once say anything about war crimes, illegal war, or arresting the perpetrators. Welcome to my hometown. Okay, thank you. May I hear your response? No, go. Uh, I mean, there are countless war crimes to talk about, and I talk about many of them in my book. Name so. one. Well, I, there's a whole section on Hama, which you just mentioned, in Syria, which I have in the book. I mean, but Then why is he a resident in Spain when we're well, after all the terrorists? He's protected by the Spanish government until the government changed. Then he ran. Okay, next. <laughs> no comment from you. I heard nothing. Okay, we've got time for this before we got there. Let's say, I'll just say we have time for three more questions. I, um, I just want to say um, congratulations on the book. And what I, I obviously have to read it to know, um, you know more what's in it, but what delighted me was your conclusion. Um, obviously, you said it at the end, and I was, you know, that's what I was really keen to find out. Because I'm a Pakistani, grew up in Pakistan, and I remember, I mean, I'm the generation that was given very liberal education. We were all, uh, I, um, I thought it was interesting you said all Muslims are pious. I'm not sure that they are. But um, I do remember that while we were given very uh, liberal education, it is true that, uh, at least in Pakistan, you know, most Muslims at home were um, religious. Um, um, Anyway, your conclusion, I think, is extremely important because, you know, four years have gone by since 9-11. And to me, absolutely the most important thing is that the education has to be given in the Muslim world, uh, which is liberal, which is, uh, you know, which um, education which gets them jobs because I think, you know, one of the biggest problems is uh, joblessness. You, you should probably ask a question, uh, Certainly in too, Pakistan so and all, you know, the world. My question t to you and to everybody, frankly, is, I mean, to, uh, you know, uh, I'm coming from a simple uh, point of view. I'm coming from a point of view that, <clears throat> to me, it almost seems like an obvious conclusion, you know, that if you educate these people and they know what the West is and that the West is not against Islam, per se, then, you know, all the sympathy that people have developed towards uh, now the fanatics, um, which is very sad, because there aren't schools to send. Now, the thing that bothers okay, wait, me is that in that, Pakistan... No, the there are other people that want to ask questions, yeah. so... My, so my thing is that, you know, with three or 4,000 madrasas in Pakistan, how is it that, you know, that's not where all the attention is going? What, what is your view on that? I mean, obviously, you've come to the, in my view, the right conclusion. But what are the practical problems? The practical problems would require like three more books, I think, to <laughs> to talk about them. But I, but I, yeah. I think what I the, the one sentence answer I could give to you is that the way you fight Islamist terrorism is not with the military, but by removing the uh, the pressure that causes people to join these kinds of radical movements and which provides fuel for the organizers of exactly. these radical movements to find recruits. Exactly. And the way you do that, um, I think, involves some fairly dramatic changes in the way we approach the whole region. Um, but that's, that's the subject for many, many other kinds of discussions. and. So on, but I don't think the Pentagon is going is the right tool to use uh, against quote terrorism unquote. Exactly. <laughs> okay, let's do these three gentlemen short questions, and then we're going to be out of time. Bob, so this is what you've been up to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this may take books and books, but say something, please, about the position of Israel in all this especially in the light of Sharon's disabling sickness this last two days, and how it can help us deal with the situation you're discussing here? Well, this, this is a problem that goes way, way beyond Israel. And a lot of uh, Muslims and Islamists, you know, use Israel as a rallying cry when they don't really care all that much about it, especially if they're in Indonesia or Pakistan or somewhere else. But 
Certainly the problem of Israel and its relationship with the Arabs is a core issue for many, many people. Um, and when I spoke earlier about lowering the temperature in the region, if there could be an arrangement, a satisfactory arrangement between the Israelis and the Palestinians, it would drastically lower, I think, the temperature and reduce the anger and the bitterness and the, all, all that kind of stuff. Now, how you get from here to there, that's, you know, involves all kinds of road maps and everything. But um, the Israelis um, have been divided on this Islam issue just the way the Americans have. There were many Israelis, including in the Mossad, for instance, who thought it was completely stupid to try to build up the Islamists on the West Bank at a time when the occupying authorities were, were doing that. Uh, there are many other you know, examples of that in terms of the way Israel has been divided and debating. So there's no single Israeli position. Um, but when you have somebody like Sharon, who I guess we can speak ill of him because he's not dead yet, <laughs> Uh, when Sharon tromped onto the Temple Mount uh, with his muddy boots and clomped all around the Muslim holy places in, I guess it was 1998 or 99, I can't remember the exact timetable, it, it literally sparked a whole other intifada that vastly gave more power to the Islamic side of the Palestinian equation. And that was just dumb. Now, did he know that that was going to happen? I, I don't know, but I can't believe it wasn't something other than an actual intended provocation to, to try to, you know, um, make it more difficult rather than less difficult uh, for Israel to give up the West Bank. I'm very ignorant about these matters. I'm a bit surprised that on the assumption that the Israelis have much deeper insights into some of these things you're discussing here, that those insights didn't come back to us over here and get taken in a different way than they have Lots been. of people know but more than the Americans. We're, we're an innocence abroad society. I, I quote Mark Twain in the book because of his, his voyage to the Middle East in the 19th century. It's so typical of American naivete and ignorance. And the British know a lot more about it than we do the French do. Um, certainly all the people who are over there, including the Israelis, know. But we seem to invent the world every time we get out of bed in the morning. I've managed to live here successfully 28 years, so I'm winning. Okay, two more. Uh, Bob Dreyfus, I want to congratulate you on a very courageous book and um, your willingness to speak about issues that mo most journalists in this town are afraid to go near. Um, uh, yet I still have to read the book, and I will. Um, uh, you, might mind. you might have <laughs> thank you as you might have heard uh, on Fox News earlier this week uh, uh, s there were calls for the recreation of operation Phoenix uh, which the CIA ran uh, uh, a wholesale assassination program under William Colby uh, a cre recreation of operation Phoenix in in Iraq and yet of course as you stated earlier uh, it's already in in, in place uh, there is already an assassination uh, program, a uh, death squad program, uh, and many innocent people, uh, most, most of the people in Iraq, I believe, are innocent, um, are paying, paying the price of, for really what is U.S. policy. Can you speak about uh, George Bush, if you had a chance to ask him the question, uh, what, where is this going? You know, it's really the wrong question to ask what I would say to Bush. I mean, I, um, I don't think, I would ask him, first of all, if he knows the difference between Iraq and Iran. You have to start there. Um, uh, if I had a chance to talk to Cheney, it um, might be a little bit different. But I think um, there's no arguing with people who believe that America has a, a holy mission um, to export its uh, unique claim on truth to the rest of the world. And that's really what I think animates the core of the neoconservative world outlook. So to me, that's, it, it's, um, it's almost a hopeless argument. What worries me more about Bush is to what extent his religious faith animates his approach toward Iraq. Um, he, uh, as a born-again Christian <coughs> fundamentalist, uh, no doubt buys into some of the theories that were being circulated by um, people like Roberts, Pat Robertson and Tim LaHaye that Saddam was the Antichrist and that, that 
the, the fields of Babylon in Iraq would be the um, launching pad for Armageddon um, and, and the battle, the ultimate battle with the Antichrist against the Israelis who now all converted to be Christian and whatever that, that story is. So I think, um, I think Bush probably thinks more in those terms than he does about geopolitics and worries about China getting its hands on the Persian Gulf, which is, I think, more how Cheney approaches the region. So I don't know. That probably doesn't answer your question, but it lets you know what I think about Bush anyway. <laughs> Hi, there are many questions that come to mind with this discussion, but um, it seems to me that if I look back at U.S. policies in Latin America, there were similar mistakes, and I think the mistakes are getting bigger every day. Don't you think there is a need for people of the United States to understand how powerful the U.S. is to make uh, such major changes and effects that hurt itself? I agree with everything you said, but I don't know how to do that. Um, I think if I were president, um, I would have a foreign policy based on the necessity of ending poverty and illiteracy and disease and hunger in all the parts of the world that are now so um, chaotic and and war plagued and it doesn't take a lot of money to, to do that in fact um, for the amount of money that we've spent on the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan um, there's a chart up at the United Nations on the wall that shows how much money it would take to give every person in the world clean drinking water and how much money it would take to inoculate against all infectious diseases every person in the world and how much money it would take to provide, and, and just down the list of basic housing and, and nutrition and so forth. It isn't that much money. It's a, it's a, a few hundred billion dollars. Um, so that's what our foreign policy ought to be based on. And if we did that, I think we'd find that most of the conflicts in the world would melt away. And I don't think that's idealistic. I think that's a, a practical foreign policy that ought to be the core of American foreign policy and it's also one I'm sure that I'll never see in my lifetime because it makes sense so what can I say it's 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 discouraging I guess the question was that overall uh, doesn't the United States